if any official research has ever been done on this question. But if I were to ask you, what do you think is the most common question that children ask, what would you say? I actually did do a, a Google search and it confirmed my suspicions. I don't think it's a scientific uh, poll, but it confirmed my suspicions. What do you think it would be? Why? The most frustrating question in the world, three letters, one word, why? Sometimes it's when kids really want to know why. We're in traffic. Dad, why, why did that car just honk at us? Uh, sometimes it's just because children like to ask that question to hear their own voices. Why is there air? Why is the wind blowing? Why is the grass green? But usually, it's either when they don't get something they want. So, can I have another cookie? No. Why? Or, when they have to do something they don't want to do. Please go clean your room. Why? I'm not sure that any of us ever truly grow out of the why phase. We just change the person or people to whom we ask the question. So consciously or, or subconsciously, we start to turn that why question away from our parents as we grow and mature and toward God. Now, every statement and promise or instruction that's given by God should be accepted unconditionally by us, his children. Now, I want to back up for a second and ask you, what's the most common default way that parents answer the question, why? Because I said so. Because I said so. As your dad, as your mom, because I said so, that's the answer. Now, sometimes that is God's answer also to his children. There are some whys that we would have no capacity to understand. And therefore, God says, I can't explain it to you. You will never grasp it. It's because I said so. But there are other times when in his love and mercy, God does pull back the curtain and he shows his, his people, he shows his children why he commands us to do certain things or to not do certain things. Today, we're going to begin looking at Psalm 103. It's one of my favorite psalms. I think it's one of the psalms that provides the most comfort to humanity. This psalm starts with a clear exhortation or command, but the rest of the psalm explains why the command should be obeyed. We'll be looking just at the first five verses today, Psalm 103, 1 through 5, and they, they read as follows. Praise the Lord, O my soul. All my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. David starts this psalm by talking to himself. In fact, the whole psalm is actually an internal dialogue that David's having with himself. Now today, if you catch someone talking to themselves, you take a step back. Unless you're my family, when they catch me talking to myself, they laugh. It's happened a couple times. I'll be maybe in the kitchen getting breakfast ready. I don't even know that anyone else is nearby. I'm thinking about something, and without considering it, I say it out loud. I wonder what's happening. With... And then I hear, <clears throat> and then I turn around. and say, Dad, what did you say? Who are you talking to? You know, or Julie says, Nathaniel, who are you talking to? What did you say? And they all want to, I'm like, never mind, never mind. It's embarrassing. It's uncomfortable. It's awkward. But David often speaks to himself, to his own soul in his psalms. Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? 
Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him. He often talks to himself. We live in a world that is constantly, constantly bombarding us with lies. Lies about ourselves, lies about reality, lies about God, lies about truth, lies about other people. And this practice of speaking truth to ourselves, to our own souls, that's a great practice. It's not our truth that we're speaking, it's God's truth. But that practice engages us on a number of different levels. It engages our minds, it engages our mouth or our voices, it engages our ears and our hearing. So it's engaging a lot of who and what we are when we do that. One song that we sing here fairly often is called Nailed to the Cross, uh, originally uh, written and recorded by Ren Collective. The first verse lyrics read like this, When I stand accused by my regrets and the devil roars his empty threats. What's the next phrase? I will preach the gospel to myself, for I am not a one condemned. I will preach the gospel to myself. In essence, that's what David's doing. And it's it's a good practice for the children of God to follow David's example in this, to speak truth to ourselves. When we hear the lies, maybe we're starting to believe a lie, we say no. And say it out loud, probably not on the bus, probably not at your desk at work, if you're surrounded by colleagues, but when you're alone. Speak it out loud. And David gives his soul a command. What is that command? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul, all my inmost being, praise his holy name. He wants that praise, though, to go beyond just the outside, beyond outer actions. Our temptation is to disguise what's really inside with our outer appearance. That's, I think, a foundational temptation for every human being. There's that self-preservation, a fear of being exposed, a fear of people seeing our brokenness. And so we disguise our internal selves with our outward actions and our outward appearances. And David, when he talks about praising the Lord to his soul, he's saying, all my inmost being, I want, in essence, my outside to reflect my inside. So may my praise to God not only be external, but may it start at the core of my being. And and we're left with this question of how do we address this issue? How do we bring coherence between our inner reality and our inner attitude and our outer actions? Now, I, I posed at the beginning the question, why? It's on the screen. Why, why should we praise the Lord? And David gives that command to himself, and by extension, we hear it for ourselves. And he answers the why, but the why is also the how. How does, how will my inner self be coherent with my outer actions. So how do my outer actions of praise actually reflect the inner truth and a heart of praise within me? And the answer to that how is right there in that first verse, forget not all his benefits. Praise the Lord, O my soul, all my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. What does that mean? What does it mean to forget not God's benefits? It means to intentionally remember, rehearse, celebrate, and meditate on God's blessings. This is the ancient Near Eastern way of saying, don't take God and his blessings for granted. Full disclosure, most of you already know this. I lost my driver's license back in July because I had too many points, too many tickets, on my record. So for the last six months, I haven't been driving. I got my driver's license back last week, Tuesday. It's been a wonderful thing. Interesting though, to me, how much or how many of the benefits of driving I 
totally took for granted until I lost my license. And I remember handing that license over there at Detran, Armenia, and, and then looking at the date they gave me when I could come back and pick it up six months later and leaving and knowing, okay, I, I realize this, I realize this is a, a beyond a first world problem, okay? And there are many of you in this room who are saying, I deal with that every day, what's your problem? But knowing that I had two subway lines, plus a train, plus an Uber at the other end to get home, and I was like, this is my reality for the next six months. And you're saying to me right now, this is my reality every day, what's your problem? I understand that, forgive me. I'm just using this as an example to say, I got to know public transportation a lot better in the last six months, and I realized how much of driving I had taken for granted. There are so many gifts and blessings of the Lord that we live in and experience daily and we're rarely conscious of them. So David says to his soul, soul, let's intentionally remember all God's gifts and benefits. Let's make a list and then think about that list. And he proceeds to do it. He proceeds to make a list. If we, along with David, focus on these blessings, the question, why should I praise the Lord, will be answered. The first thing on David's list is that God forgives all your sins. This is maybe one of the easiest blessings to take for granted. Because, well, in part because we don't take sin very seriously, really. But when we do catch just a glimpse of the severity of our own sin, then we begin to gain a profound appreciation for God's forgiveness. We tend to, to hurt the people who are closest to us. And I haven't necessarily keep, kept track, but I'm pretty sure that the person I have hurt the most over the course of my life has been my wife, Julie simply because we're with each other a lot. And uh, a few years ago, I remember that I made an offhand comment without thinking it through that was meant to be funny, but was actually deeply hurtful to her. And it did not take me long to realize it. It was one of those situations where the words are kind of like, ah, coming out and I'm already trying to like grab them out here and shove them back in, it's too late. And I, I realized how profoundly that pain had penetrated to her heart. And just a short time later, when she blessed me with her forgiveness, I was so humbled, but I was also so grateful because I understood how much that cost her. That it, it was not something that, that was free. She paid for that forgiveness. And when I understood how much I had hurt her, then I came to appreciate that forgiveness all the more. And our sin before God is so serious that we deserve utter destruction and torture and eternal pain. You know this already. I know this. It's so serious that it cost Jesus his life to buy our forgiveness. We often hear the phrase, forgiveness is free, but it's not. We receive it freely. The cost is not ours to pay because Jesus paid the cost. But it's actually very expensive and very costly. It cost his life. Jesus, may we, your people, never forget your forgiveness. The second blessing or benefit that David lists is that God heals all your diseases. God is the only great healer. And in this context, remember, David is speaking to his soul. So while this healing may indeed at times encompass healing of the body, let us not forget the healing of the diseases of the soul. That's where the emphasis of this phrase is going. Our bodies are temporary. No matter how well cared for they are, no matter how strong or healthy, no matter how much faith you have, no matter how many vitamins you take, no matter how healthy your diet, whether you are vegan or keto or South Beach or vegetarian, your body is going to grow old. It's going to decay and break down, weaken, 
and die. I don't like to think about that. But it's a reality of life on fallen earth. But our souls will live forever. And David is convinced of the power and goodness of God to heal all the diseases of the soul. It's interesting to me that the greatest miracles that God performs are the ones that we most take for granted. And we are most astonished by the lesser miracles. We're astonished by miracles of healing. We're astonished by miracles of nature. And yet the fact that God could heal the soul, the fact that salvation, meaning moving someone out of condemnation to eternal destruction and making them a child of God, that that doesn't seem miraculous to us. That seems normal. Consider the diseases of the soul. There are many. You could add to this list, but some that came to my mind are pride, anxiety, doubt, fear, judgmentalism, legalism, shame. That may be one of the most insidious ones, shame and guilt. Those diseases of the soul that sap the strength of the body. And you know this, when our souls are diseased like this, it affects all parts of our being, our bodies, our minds, our spirits, and it, they keep us in bondage. And David's saying, God, you are the healer of all my diseases. Thirdly, David says that God redeems his life from the pit and crowns him with love and compassion. I don't need to go into too much uh, definition of what a pit is. I think we can all conjure up in our own imaginations a pit. And just to be clear, God did not put us in this pit. We dove into this pit. We jumped into this pit. We have chosen the pit. He uses the word redeem, and that's a word that is profoundly graceful and merciful. It relates to the fact that all people were created by God and for God. We belonged to him as his creation, yet each one of us has rebelled against our creator and our Lord. We've given ourselves to Satan. We have given ourselves to Satan, the great enemy of God and the enemy of our souls. Through sin, we've done that. Beginning with Adam and Eve and then tearing down through every single generation and every single descendant, and by earthly standards, any return to God should be accomplished by our sacrifice. We should have to pay that debt. We should have to defeat Satan, our false master, in order to return to God, our true master. But God looks with love on his creation, and he took the initiative to buy us back. That's what the word redeem means. It means to buy back. We have fled from him, we have rejected him, we have jumped into the pit, and yet he is still the one who buys us back. And he did so through Jesus who died in our place. That's redemption. Though we originally belonged to God, we left him, and yet he still pays the price for our restoration. But according to this verse, God doesn't just bring his people back to ground zero. So if we, if we have this physical imagination of a pit, there's a deep pit, God does not just bring us back out onto the level ground. He exalts us. It goes beyond. He redeems my life from the pit and he crowns me with love and compassion. Think about a crown. What is the purpose of a crown? For what is it used? What is its significance? A crown honors and exalts the person who is wearing it. It makes a statement about that person's identity. This person is royalty. And David says to his soul, God not only redeems us from the pit, but then he crowns us. He honors us. He exalts us with what? He puts his love and his compassion 
on us and honors us with his love and compassion. So it's not just a bringing back to zero. It's an exaltation that goes beyond. Uh, about 24, 25 years ago, I remember having an encounter with one of my professors from college. And in that, in that encounter, for the first time, for the first time, I confessed to another human being, to this man, I confessed my addiction at the time to pornography. And he ministered the grace and the mercy and the forgiveness of God to me. He prayed over me. He lifted me up. He gave me hope. He gave me peace. It wasn't his. It was God's that was ministered through him. About two months later, I got a, a telephone call. Yes, I, I didn't misspeak. It was a telephone call, not a cell phone call. It was a telephone call. The phone was attached to the wall by this thing called a wire. And <laughs> Weird. Um, I got a call and I answered the phone. I happened to be home and it was someone I, I didn't know. And they said, is this Nathaniel Fawcett? I said, yes, it is. And they said, um, I'm one of the organizers for this university conference event that we hold every three years here in um, Illinois. Uh, it's kind of a nationwide conference for college students and university students with missions as a focus. And uh, your name has been referred to us as someone that we would like to invite to give a testimony at this event. We'll have about 10,000 students there and we'd like to invite you to share. And I was shocked and blown away. And uh, I was even more surprised when I said, well, 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 why are you asking me? And they said, well, your name was given to us by Dr. Lyle Dorsett who was the man to whom I had confessed a few months earlier. And I remember at that moment being so humbled and yet so honored because not only had Dr. Dorsett ministered to me God's forgiveness, God's hope, his mercy, his joy, but then he also, in a sense, had elevated me and beyond that. And knowing who I was and knowing what I had done, and yet he lifted me up. And to me, that's an image of God bringing us out of the pit on one hand, but then going beyond that to honor and exalt us. God redeems his children, then he honors them. Forget not this benefit. And lastly for today, not lastly for the psalm, but lastly for today, he satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagle's. Perhaps more than any of the other benefits listed so far, this one requires faith. I believe it was C.S. Lewis that said that all sin has its root in a legitimate desire that is met in an illegitimate way. So as an example, we can consider that each human being is fashioned, is made, is created with a deep desire for intimacy. That desire is not wrong. It comes from the fact that we're made in the image of God and that we reflect the perfect union and intimacy of the Trinity. But sin comes in and twists that desire so we try to meet that good desire in an illegitimate way. And just as an example, this is where much of the sexual brokenness in the world originates. It's not primarily the physical desire that drives sexual perversion, but rather the instinctual need and desire for intimacy. But when that desire is met in an, a broken or twisted or illegitimate fashion, that is sin. And this is where it's a challenge to our faith. Will we trust God to meet those desires with good things? And I'm, I'm the first to acknowledge that's not an easy place to be. Because the faith, our faith, it's going to be tested usually by waiting and by delay. So that desire, there, there's a delay for that desire to be met. And the longer that delay, the longer we live in that delay, the more tempted we are to say, God, I'm, I'm going to have to find my own way out of this. I'm going to have to make my own answer. I'm going to have to 
to seek a, a sinful, broken solution because this desire is not being met. So will we trust that God will meet our right desires with good things and that we won't need to seek sinful, broken solutions? But there's a cause and effect in these two phrases. When our desires are met with good, then our youth, and by youth we can understand that he's talking about strength and joy, energy and hope, our youth is renewed like the eagles. And there are very few images of power and freedom and light than a huge eagle, you know, soaring on the, the currents of the wind above the earth. And that's the image that God gives. Like that eagle, when, if you wait, if you trust until I meet your right desires with good things, then you're going to be re-energized, given joy, strength, hope, and you'll soar your strength. It's going to be renewed like the eagles. I have way too many examples of this in my own life, but I'll just pick one. I remember one particular week in college, I don't know, 25 years ago, whatever, when um, I had had a long week. It was Friday. My classes were done. I didn't have any responsibilities that night. And I thought, I can't wait to rest and relax. That's what I'm doing tonight, rest and relax. So what did I do? Oh, with some friends, I watched movies all night. We actually went to the store. You used to go to the store where you would actually rent these things that were about this big and they were hard and plastic. They were called uh, videotapes. So we rented several of them and then we, we, we watched them. And by the time Saturday morning came, my youth was not renewed like the Eagles. Um, even back then, I, am, I was not a night person. I'm still not a night person. 8.30 feels like midnight to me. You can ask my family. I like hit a wall, I'm done. So that staying up that one night, even though I was in my early 20s, it affected me for almost an entire week after that. My strength was not renewed. My joy was not renewed. I actually felt, this is the way I would describe that Saturday. Okay, just the Saturday, I would describe it in one, it's not really a word, it's an expression. Okay, here it is. Ugh, all day. Take notes, you can write that down. Ugh, O-U-G-H. Um, so, and, and it affected my energy. It affected my joy for the rest of the week. It took me another week to recover. The point is that the good thing is not always the fun thing, the most exciting thing or the easiest thing. But in faith, it's the faith in God's promise, his benefit that he will meet our desires with good things and that when he does, that will bring renewal. That will bring strength, joy, hope, energy. We'll be studying the rest of the psalm in the coming weeks, but today the com this command lies before us. Praise the Lord, O my soul. How? By meditating and thinking about and thanking him for all his benefits. This is a discipline. So even as David put this into practice, that's a challenge for us to put it into practice. So this week... I challenge you, make a list of God's benefits. Make a list of his blessings to you. And then think about them. Rehearse them in your mind. Then the question, why? Because he forgives all our sins. And he heals all our diseases. He redeems our lives from the pit and crowns us with love and compassion because he satisfies our desires with good things so that our youth is renewed like the eagles. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul.